Ai de să-ți cer cu aia. Patru, două, 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 And it says, 
in order for young people to be successful in life, they must form good habits and be the older folks must be the by example. Thank you. That's a great thing. 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 Great Thank you. 
of faith. God has emotions according to the scriptures he loves, hates, grieves, and sorrows, and he is referred to as jealous. However, he rises above emotions in all his decisions that he makes. There is a Native American saying, you cannot judge a man until you have walked in his moccasins or his shoes. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I would ask uh, Brother Dennis Mohammed to come forward so that you can introduce, say a few words and then introduce our beloved brother. In the most holy name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, the all wise and true living God, who came to us in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, the great Mahdi, who was to come and did come. We thank him for, th for coming and we thank him for raising up one in our midst, a divine leader, teacher, and guide in the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank them both for seeking and searching amongst us, knowing that we would have needed one in this hour, knowing that we would have needed one in 2019. We thank them for finding the Honorable Minister Luz Parker. In the Nation of Islam, we refer to him as the last man standing. Because as you know, there are many, there are many of us that are males. There are many of us that are boys. But what is the difference between a man and a boy? A bo the difference between a man and a boy is a man is one that speaks truth regardless of circumstances. Speak truth regardless of the situation. So the man that I'm speaking about is a man that speaks truth regardless of circumstances and regardless of situation. And he has taught us the same way, just as he was trained by the man that I'm talking about, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So in these great men name, I greet you, my beloved brothers and sisters. In the greater words of peace, we say it in Arabic language, Assalamu alaikum. It simply means peace be unto you. To my original African family hotel, if there are any Hindus in the house, I say Shalom. A Sariyat Christian Shalom, which also means peace. To the Hindus, Shanti, Shanti. And why do I give the collective greetings? Respecting everyone. Because the nation of Islam is about unity. The nation of Islam is not about division. This goal that we have to liberate our people, we see every group playing a part in achieving this goal. So the Christian might say, Brother Dennis, I'm using seven and three as my formula. The Muslim might say, I'm using eight and two as my formula. The, the Rastafarian community may use six and four. And then our African brothers and sisters, they may use five and five. What is the common denominator? The common denominator there is ten, but the common denominator among us is that we are wrecked as a people. We are people now that are seeking what is called reparations. And our brother David Muhammad is capable of doing that. But this brother that is before you is a brother just like any old Guyanese. I could have decided to stay in the ghetto and just be called a ghetto kid. I could have decided to stay in the world and just do like the world is doing. And you know what is most dynamic about the teachings of the Most Honorable Muhammad? These teachings can take you and make you into anything that you want to be. The brand before you, honestly speaking, never graduated from none of your high schools. It takes five subjects to graduate from a high school in Guyana, is that right? So the Most Honorable Muhammad has the ability to take a brother that is not even a high school graduate and make him into something. But the David and the opposite, He's a graduate from the University of West Indies, just got his doctorate in sociology. But he didn't stop there. But David also was just honored by the United Nations as an um, peace ambassador. And much, much more about him, I'm sure, in the few. But look at the majesty of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And take it, a brother like myself. Why is it, I would ask myself, I was never successful at high school. Some of my roots and the lines are very important, brothers and sisters. Your genes are most important. In this audience is my father's eldest brother. And this man, Otto Luis, stand right over there, this man has 
the interest of the black man in his heart. So much so that he would change his name to Guyana. That is how much he loved black and loved Guyana. I never met this man until I was at the age of 32 years old. But now we have a beautiful relationship. So I'm learning now that in the, my genes, there was always that love for black people. And brothers and sisters, let me say something about this black cause. We must be able to love our people more than they hate themselves. What does that mean? Even though our people might be going down today, we hear leaders saying on national television, there is nothing we can do about this. In the nation of Islam, we never give up. If it's one and two and three and four, we will teach and we will teach and we will teach. And so look at the majesty of the teaching of the most honorable life, Muhammad. Because I, Dennis Muhammad, never was contented because I never graduated from high school. I was never contented that my children coming from my house will take the same path. And so I was determined when I get my children, it will be a different guy. He's from a different kettle of fish. And so I wanted to buttress what I know from the nation of Islam in the world's education now with my children. And so my eldest son graduated from GPI. My eldest daughter, Queen's College. My second son that is sitting in the audience, Bishop High School. His, his sister, Marna Academy, your leading private institution in terms of secondary education. He got 11 subjects at CXC. My daughter, a grade one in mathematics at Queen's College. His sister, 10 subjects at CXC, both of them now in 6 form. Why am I saying this to you? I want you to see the majesty of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and what he put in us. Because after he brings the teachings to us, it is not for you to remain the same. The Bible says that blessed are the poor for they shall be called the children of God. But after we accept Jesus, this Christ, it is not for us to stay poor anymore. After we accept this Jesus Christ, it is not for us to stay uneducated anymore. But it's for us now to buttress what this world has to offer for education with the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And let me say something about that. Anything outside of buttressing what this world has to offer for education, Anything outside of, budget, of, of not budgeting that with the teachings is a waste of time. Because the entire education system of this country, this Caribbean, and the world, it's based on white supremacy. And so we're all taught to be sympathetic with white people, even in asking for reparations today. When we talk, black people would say, why are they going over this reparation talk? Do you know why we speak like that? It is because we don't even know ourselves. Don't realize Muhammad said that we are the maker, the owner, the cream of this planet, God of the universe. Woo. We thought that we were Negroes and niggers, and we thought that our experience started after 400 years of slavery and servitude, because that's what they taught us in school. They never taught us that we were kings and queens brought from Africa. They never taught us that we were great architects. As a matter of fact, the most organized woman can't live for it. He said, do not content in just being a believer. But you should move beyond becoming a God. He said, every time you look in the mirror, black man, you are seeing God. Because you were created in the image, meaning the physical, and the life. His essence. So you were created in the image and likeness of God. So when you look in the mirror, you see God. So when you look at your brother, who are you looking at? Oh, you're looking at God. So how can you hate your brother and sister every day? But you love God, whom you have never seen. Beloved brothers and sisters, indeed we are in a crisis. Even as we seek reparation. Do you know what is the truth? Some of you don't want to hear this. But you know who are more willing to support our struggle in terms of finance? Our Indian brothers and sisters. How is that? We were in a crisis and our Indian brothers and sisters would put their hand in their pocket faster and give our struggle. 
Because this is what we say, brother, I'm over everybody. I cannot just do for black people. This is our whole language. And that's fine. If I'm the leader of this nation, it means that I have to look out for everybody. But you know what happened in that equation of looking out for everybody? Little or nothing at all is done for black people. And so when we even ask for a ministry of black people affairs, which only means that we will be budgeted for, that's turned down. Do you know why? Because we do not have enough love for self. We have been trained to help, hate self so much. So that when we see one crime, we stare him down. All because we are afraid that he will grow and get better than me. And so somebody asked today, let's start a conversation. Let's start a think tank. There ain't no conversation. You don't need no think tank. The blueprint for the liberation of the black man is there, given by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. But some of us just don't want to accept what is in front of us. You say because they are religious. Religion in this sense only makes only means that I'm right. You heard what I said in the beginning. The nation of Islam don't divide themselves into little groups. We see all of us as all of our people as family. And so when I come to you and I say that I'm a Muslim, I'm not saying that I'm Arab. I'm not saying that I'm bringing you something that was started by Prophet Muhammad. Because some of the ministers who spoke and said that if Prophet Muhammad brought Islam, we don't want it. We don't want a religion of Muhammad, peace be upon him. We don't want a religion of Moses and Abraham and Noah. We want a religion that God himself practiced. We want a religion that is God. And so that is what I bring to you. Submission, which is the will of God himself. And so we reject Arab culture. So you must be walking in here with a long boat, with a long beard. Now they're ready to beard. No. Because I know my identity. My identity runs beyond Guyana. Because Guyana turned independence, they call it Guyanese, in 1966. But prior to that, we were the Guyanas. That's Suriname, Guyana, this Guyana. We were one country. And we go beyond that. The most horrible life the woman said that the entire world at one time was called Asia. But did we stop there? No. We can even go to Africa. And this is a little, this is a little uh, painful sometimes when you say, we even go beyond Africa. Our beginning is in God Himself. And that is why the most of the last moment said that we are a direct reflection of Almighty God. My beloved brothers and sisters, this is the challenge that is before us today. All of us are religious, and I have to tell you, all of us are political too. But you know what is the big struggle for us today? The big struggle for us today is for us to put our blackness over our religion, our blackness over our politics. Uh oh See? And that's where we are today. We cannot put our blackness above our politics. And so the political leaders get more respect than the black leaders. The religious leaders, they get more respect and honor than the black leaders. When black is your true identity. Black is not a color, but black is the essence and the base from which all colors come from. The Holy Quran says that Allah God, this is the Quran, most of you Muslims should know this. Allah God created man from black clay and fashioned him into shape and broke his breath in him and he became a living soul. The Bible didn't say he did anything different. The Bible bears witness to that. The Bible said, yeah, the air has level. My brothers to the back. And think that British brass and know that's a black man. Why am I not proud to say that we're black? And then you put in place what is called a social ministry of social cohesion, which is to soothe things, you know. So, brother, you gotta be careful when we talk now. And as black people, we don't even realize that that's the trick. It's all for you to talk soft. And don't speak the truth. The Bible is there to prove it. Even the head of the social cohesion needs to be taught this teaching today. Because many of them, they don't even know themselves. The three main knowledge that the most of the lives of the 
said that we should possess is a knowledge of self in terms of we, who we are. The book, Bible, bears witness to here and they said, Man, know thyself. And knowledge of self is most important for you. And if you can get that book message to the black man by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, it will give you a good explanation in terms of who you are as a black man. So a knowledge of self, a knowledge of God. There is no mystery God, brothers and sisters. There ain't no God in the sky that will bust open the clouds one day and come down. No. When I look at my fellow brothers and sisters, I am seeing God. But most of all, the main knowledge that all of us must get is the knowledge of the devil. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the color man is Yaqub's grafted devil. You thought you were color, right? Color means to change, come on. Color means to change. You want to change, you're black still. So the colored man is Yaqub's grafted devil. The white man, the skunk of the color. Think! Who are the enemies of Burnham when he was alive? Think, think. Who are the enemies of Teddy Jagger in his early years of politics. Of course, we know Teddy was sanitized. And the other minister was far and said, I'm put back before us in 92. And so the Teddy that we got in 92 wasn't the Teddy of the 70s and the, and the 60s, no. But Burnham had an ideology saying that I will not give my resources for a mega amount. The same enemy that Burnham had, they're here today. And you know what? We're in bed with them. The funny thing is, we as Guyanese, we're not saying it. And you know what it is? In slavery, when you stay quiet, they will continue to beat you. But once you make noise, they will stop beating you. And so we continue to stay. just need a support. That is all we need. We can't accomplish this mission all by ourselves. You're truly dead as well when I'm trying with limited resources that is available to me. If I am supported, I bring the nation of Islam teachings to you every second. Because I know that is what is needed for our people. The nation of Islam teachings represents a rounded black man. Mentally, Morally, physically, psychologically, every respect of the black man we deal with. And so this, let me say something about Brother David Muhammad. We spoke so far at the teacher's rally. We spoke in Linden. We spoke at the Fitness Church, who some of you will refer to as the Obia Church. Not to understand that what we call Obia really is all they did is they put a different face on it and then the white people says they do now. But everything that the white people have is ours. Yeah. They just take it and put a gift and paper on it yeah. and they present it back to us. And now we are excited over all these different white scientists. All that they learn, they learn it from us. But everywhere we went, look at the respect given to our brother, the Eastern Caribbean representative of the other ministries. And you know what's the biggest question I ask myself? With all the accolades that is bestowed upon this doctor, with all the accolades that is bestowed upon our brother that is this uh, peace ambassador, he remains with a humble posture. Remind me of the scripture that says, He that humbled himself shall be exalted, and he that exalted himself shall be humbled. Guyana, George Stone. Help me to receive one of the greatest helpers of the Honorable Minister Luz Farkan in the nation of Islam, Brother Dr. David Muhammad. Thank you.
there is but one God. We thank Almighty God Allah for giving to us the prophet Abraham and the monotheistic principle, for Moses and the Old Testament of the Torah, for Jesus the Messiah and the New Testament of the Injil, and for the prophet Muhammad and the Holy Quran and its Sunnah. Peace be upon all of these worthy servants of Almighty God Allah. But as a black man in the Western Hemisphere, I cannot be thankful enough to Almighty God Allah for giving to us today a divine leader, teacher, and guide, and for raising up the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and reconnecting us to the knowledge of Islam, of our past heritage, and also for giving to us today the Honorable Minister of America, who has been leading the liberation struggle of our people consistently and continuously for the past six decades. Beloved family, I greet you in the greeting of peace in the Arabic language of As-Salaam Let's first please give our beloved sister Penda of the Diana Reparations Council a warm hand for her great work for her
where tens of thousands attended the gathering in Chicago, Illinois, to hear Minister Farrakhan speak on the topic, reparations, what does America and Europe owe, what does God promise? In this address, Minister Louis Farrakhan explained that there is both a spiritual as well as a political dimension to the discussion of reparations as the scriptures of God in both Bible and Quran teach on the principles of justice as it pertains to enslavement. The reparations caused for African people must be one in which both the politics and the culture of the people become involved in pushing and fighting for it to become a reality. In addition to the Nation of Islam's call for the concept of reparations going back to before the 1950s, and in addition to the fact that the Nation of Islam has hosted the largest international conference on reparations in the entire land struggle, in addition to this, the Nation of Islam has acknowledged the need for repair. And we are not waiting for our enemies to feel a sorrow and compassion in their hearts that is not in their hearts for us. Right, right. Even though we have a peculiar uh, compassion in our hearts for them, it is not wise nor sensible for us to sit around in the hope and expectation that one day the same person who committed all of these criminal deeds against us will all of a sudden recognize the injustices that he has done. This has to be a fight. This has to be a cause. This is a struggle. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said in 2002, August 16, the only reason we are here for reparations is that nothing was done to repair the damage that 400 years of slavery and injustice had done to us. They could not hold us in slavery, that narrow place of confinement, we have outgrown it. So the baby comes to birth, but the umbilical cord is still not yet cut. Right, right. You have the ability to right. breathe on your own, see on your own, think on your own, but you're still tied to your slave master right. and his children. That's right. Not in a proper way, but in a very improper manner. Mm -hmm. Minister Farrakhan has also sought to connect the conversation of today with the experiences of our people of yesterday as a form of commitment or obligation to ensure that the struggle is not in vain. Where the minister said, we must not betray our ancestors in the negotiation for what we feel is just and justly due to the children of the slaves. It is not about money. It is about what is requisite to repair the damage. Liberation is not a one-day journey. Neither is reparation, for reparation and liberation really are synonymous. You will not be free without the damage being repaired. And in order to repair the damage, you must make a proper assessment of that damage. The minister said in 2014, we have so-called diplomats speaking of justice mm. and reparations. Say it again. But justice, listen, is not always discussed in diplomatic language. But sometimes we do not want justice, but instead we want friendship with our former enemies. There are so many living as well as archived examples of our desire for nearness and friendship with our enemy as being even greater than our desire to acquire justice. Wow. The most recent being the young man, Botham Shah, accountant, law student, young, brilliant scholar, black man, well off, highly educated, with Caribbean roots from St. Lucia, in his apartment in California. A white woman kicks down his door and kills him in cold blood. She went on to make excuses about she thought it was her apartment and she didn't realize that she was in the wrong place because in the multi-layered 
car park she parked on the wrong floor and then going from the wrong floor to where her apartment was on the right floor she ended up going in this black man's house and she saw him she thought that he was an intruder in her home pulled out her license service firearm and murdered a black man in cold blood that is a dreadful story but guess what that's not even the most peculiar part of the story that's part of the story that you can hear and you can wonder if that story can get any worse but now that the white lady who was a police officer was charged with murder and given only 10 years in prison. I have never heard about a prison sentence for murder being 10 years. It's either a minimum of 25 or life. Here, we're seeing 10 years. But the worst part of the story is that after the judgment was handed down, the family members of this black man who was murdered in cold blood by this white woman hugged him, the white girl and embraced her, cried with her. They felt sorry for her. The judge felt sympathy for her. And the police officer, a black woman who was a law enforcement officer in the court, there's a video where she was stroking her hair and comforting her. Oh, how terrible it is that this white woman has to go to jail for 10 years. Meanwhile, there are millions of white people who committed crimes against humanity, against us, killing 200 million Africans. None of them ever went to jail, and there are black people who have been to prison for crimes just being accused of committing an offense against white people. And today we still find it in our hearts and feel that kind of sympathy for a white woman who kills a black man. That is nothing but a mental disease. Oh, yes, that is part of what is required oh, yes. to repair us. Oh, yes. So beloved family, the United Nations General Assembly by its resolution 68 slash 237 of December 23rd, 2013 proclaimed the International Decade for People of African Descent, which commenced on January the 1st, 2015, and is scheduled to end on December 31st, 2024. The theme of this United Nations Decade for People of African Descent is recognition, justice, and development. Following up from this, and the March 11, 2014 CARICOM 10-point plan of action reparations policy, which was agreed to by all 50 heads of government in St. Vincent and the Grenadines under the auspices of Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez. Under and following from this 10-point plan of action, we, the Nation of Islam, are calling on CARICOM governments to consider the drafting of some form of legislation to ideologically protect the academic documentation of African enslavement, also referred to in various literature as the Black Holocaust, and establish a law to outlaw, prohibit, and eventually even criminalize denial of the African Holocaust. As I will go into in detail in a short while, it is a crime in 70 countries on earth to deny the Jewish Holocaust. But the African Holocaust was over a hundred times worse than the Jewish Holocaust. That's right, that's right. And also those southern countries, these do not include the United States of America, nor England. But right now, as we speak, there are numerous cases of anti-Semitism being raised in the United States of America. And in England, there have been a number of members of parliament who have been forced to resign over alleged anti-Semitic statements made. 
But you can say anything against black people, do anything against black people, commit any injustice against African people, and you get away scot free. And there are so many other people, not African people within the Caribbean region, who contribute towards that conversation of trying to tell us slavery was not that bad. You should get over it. Then they distort the facts and the figures, give misinformation, and then write a faulty, false, flawed falsify educational curriculum and syllabus and write lies about African enslavement and then feed that to our children to discourage our children from remaining part of the struggle. That within itself is a crime. Yes, it is. When they say Jewish Holocaust denial, they don't mean someone saying that the Jewish Holocaust did not exist. Now, there are people who say that. But by law, Jewish Holocaust denial is considered under three factors. One, to significantly reduce the number of persons that were killed in the Jewish Holocaust. So, they say six million Jews were killed. If you say, for example, well, it wasn't six million Jews, it was only 600,000, then you are a criminal. Wow. Secondly, if you claim, as certain professors, Christopher Hitchens, Dr. David Irving, if you claim that it was not a mass extermination or annihilation of Jewish people, but rather it was mass deportation, then you are a criminal. And criteria number three is if you say that gas chambers were not used in the process of genocide against the Jews. And the reason that this is said, beloved, is because the Jewish Holocaust lasted for six years from 1939 to 1945. Allegedly, or apparently, some of the gas chambers that are used for museum purposes were built in 1946. Uh, the Jewish Holocaust ended in 1945. But if you claim that gas chambers were not used as part of the genocide against Jewish people, you're involved in Jewish Holocaust denial and you are committing a crime in 17 different countries. Beloved family, in Guyana, for emancipation from British slavery, there were, back in 1838, from August the 1st, 82,824 enslaved Africans in Guyana, for which we never received reparations. But, the white people who own us receive reparations for losing us as property. Think, beloved. 82,824 enslaved Africans in Guyana. And the whites who own us receive 52 British pounds for each enslaved African that they lost. This is, in British pounds, 4,306,848 British pounds converted to US dollars, 5,221,286 United States dollars. This goes back to 1838. At the economically calculated annual inflation rate of 1.38%, this gives the US dollar of 200 years ago a spending value equivalent to $19.45 US today. This means that the reparations that white slave owners in Guyana received in 1838 is equivalent to 101 million. 359,514 US dollars. 
our brother Eric Phillips in his publication, The Guyana Reparation Story, which he published in 2002, notes that there were 2,741 British slave owners in Guyana who received $4.3 million in reparations, 4.3 million pounds. The British also received an additional 27 million pounds through the process of apprenticeship, which involved an additional four years of work through a 48-hour work week. When you add up all of that money in today's value, it gives you the economy of a small country. That's right, that's right. And so reparations can begin where we enter the bargaining table where you at least give back 101 million US dollars to African people for the repair of their communities. Starting there. Yeah. And when we start there, and that first 101 million is settled, then we can continue the conversation of the murder, torture, rape, genocide, lynching, burnings, drawing and quarterings, drownings with heavy stones around our necks, cutting open the stomach of the pregnant black woman, putting out the baby, sliding it on the floor, crushing it under their boot heel. After they give us back that 101 million, then we can talk about it. In Jamaica, on Emancipation Day, according to the records, 311 and 70,000 enslaved Africans were freed by the British Act of Parliament on August 1st, 1853, which abolished slavery. While the enslaved Africans, again, should have received reparations for the crimes against humanity committed against us, it was the whites, once again, who were given 20 British pounds currency for every enslaved African that they lost. This gives us a figure of 6,221,400 British pounds, which again, at a rate of 1.21 to the US dollar, gives an equivalent of 7,527,894 US dollars. And according to the economic calculations of an annual inflation rate of 1.38% per year on the dollar, going back to almost 200 years, and the dollar of back then when slavery was abolished, to today is $19.45. This means that the whites in Jamaica received equivalent to 146 million four hundred thousand one hundred and fifty US dollars. Again, enough to start the capital for the economy of a small island by itself. Likewise in Trinidad, after emancipation. And Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana had the highest payouts. Mm. 52 pounds per African. Mm. And the funny thing is, second to Trinidad and Tobago, the highest payout was not even 30 pounds. I believe it was 29 pounds to Antigua. Many of the islands received half the payout to the whites than Trinidad and Guyana that received 52 British pounds. There were 20,657 enslaved Africans free in Trinidad and Tobago. 52 pounds to the white people for each gives us just over 1 million British pounds or 1.3 million US dollars, which in today's equivalency, 25,279,950 US. In Trinidad dollars, that's 172 million. Now remember, in each of these countries, the white population is barely 1%. You talk about quantities of money that can actually service the 50% African population in many instances. In Barbados, there were 83,150 enslaved Africans for which the whites received 21 British pounds for each. This is 1.7 million British pounds or 2.1 million US dollars and the annual 1.38% inflation rate giving a dollar of 200 years ago, $19.45 value today, that is 41 million US dollars in today's money. Now, even though we've done the research on each of these countries, 
and we published it in this book. We extracted information from those four as those are the four main pillars of CARICOM. Because on July 4th, 1973, when CARICOM was established, it was just Dr. Eric Williams of Trinidad and Tobago, Prime Minister Errol Barrow of Barbados, Brother Forbes Burnham of Guyana, and of course, Michael Manley of Jamaica. They signed the Treaty of Chagaramas, bringing CARICOM into play. But by that time, whites had already become so wealthy and economically powerful, not only from the free slave labor of slavery itself, not only from a light skin, skin color privilege that is prevalent throughout the Caribbean, and a consistent and continuous racism or colorism, as well as xenophobia, bigotry, intolerance, prejudice and social stratification and institutionalized racism, which African people are still the victims of today. Not only did the white people become rich from all of those factors, and their control of black politicians from since the full adult suffrage was passed in the British West Indies in 1946, not only were they made rich from all of those factors, but they also got free money. How could we call ourselves independent? And when we became independent, we never properly revisited those injustices. Listen, family, is that not okay? Yes, sir. You have so many different countries around the world that are new. So you have the South Sudan, which came into existence the other day. We used to have Czechoslovakia. Now we have Czech Republic and Slovakia. We used to have Yugoslavia. Now we have Kosovo and we have um, Macedonia. We have all these different countries. We used to have the USSR, which also known as Russia, but the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Now you have 14 different countries. Uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Georgia. All of those are different countries. And every time a new country is born, in the drafting of their constitution, they investigate the historical pitfalls that produced contemporary injustices for the new population and the subsequent generations, and they adjust their constitution accordingly to serve the interests of the masses of the people who are called the citizens. In the Caribbean, when we became independent, instead of historically taking into account the fact that the Callers of Prentices in 1834, free slaves in 1838, but squatters in 1840. They wrote laws such as the Master Servants Ordinance, the Habitual Idleness Ordinance, Downsall Ordinances, Sedition Ordinances, Trade Union Ordinances. The British wrote all of these laws that continued to oppress black people. And then when we became independent, and we had the opportunity to change it all, we recycled it, repackaged it, reconditioned it, and represented it, and we exchanged our freedom for symbols. So we have a national flag, a national anthem, national watchwords, national pledge, all of these poems and colors. And we, more than any other people in these cosmopolitan, multi ethnic, multicultural societies, celebrate these colors and nationality even more, in spite of the fact that we might be the poorest, the most landless, the most propertyless, the least educated, and we're jam packing the prisons. What kind of independence is that? Go ahead. Go ahead. What makes it even worse is that out of 15 members of CARICOM, 14 are independent, we still have Montserrat, which is a British colony. But out of the 15 members of Caracom, only three of them are actually republics. Guyana holds the distinction of being the first Caribbean nation to become a republic. So whereas Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica became independent in 1962, Guyana and Barbados became independent in 1966, 
Guyana became a republic four years after, in 1970. Trinidad and Tobago became a republic 14 years after independence, in 1976. And Dominica also have the exclusive distinction of being the only Caribbean nation to become a republic and independent at the same time. But those three countries, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, and Dominica, not to be confused with the Dominican Republic, and it's ironic that you have a country called the Dominican Republic with a population of over 9 million people, and Dominica itself is a republic. So both of them are really the Dominican Republic. But those three countries should really be leading the way in demonstrating what true liberation and freedom is. Because there are four kinds of republicanism. And all of them involve either the overthrow, the displacement of, the ceremonial replacement of, or the execution of a royal family or a monarch or a king of Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The United States of America, that's a true republic. Because they fought for their independence and won and wrote their own constitution. They didn't have to go to a meeting to decide on what their, co their constitution could be comprised of. So you have traditional republicanism, which is like a ceremonial transition. So we had a royal family and a monarch, and then we change to a system whereby there are no privileges or exclusive laws that ensure that members of one family or who have royal birth will remain in the nation. Then you have Renaissance Republicanism, which is transformation from one level of Republicanism to a high level, taking into consideration issues such as socialism and liberalism and even communism and incorporating them into the constitutional politics of the nation. But then you have classical or democratic Republicanism, which is like in our system here, so we negotiated with our former oppressors and came up with a new system of republicanism, detaching ourselves from the Queen of England. But the fourth kind of republicanism is radical republicanism. And even though the United States of America is in a different country to the crown, radical republicanism is demonstrated in probably what was the most influential or one of the most influential revolutions of all time. Two of them, the French Revolution and the Haitian Revolution. For the French Revolution, they snatched the king, Louis XVI, off the throne, cut off his head in the street, and busted open the Bastille prison, let out all the prisoners. And it is alleged that the story goes that you heard the wife of King Louis the Sixteenth, who was Marie Antoinette, that she made a statement when when word came to her that the people in France are suffering, the people in France are hungry, they have no bread. What did she say? Let them eat cake. She said, "Let them eat cake." Now. In her mind, so this and that are a lot of politicians like this. Yes, sir. In her mind, but they don't have bread. She doesn't even know what poverty is. The reason they didn't have bread was because of poverty. But she's thinking that, well, they don't have bread, but they have macaroni, pasta, potatoes, rice, <laughs> cakes. Well, let them eat cake instead. Oh. Where's the king? Went into his palace and took him off the throne. And that French Revolution, to this day, remains one of the most influential revolutions of all times. Radical Republicanism. But if you speak radicalism in one of these societies, you might be charged for sedition. Mm -hmm. I was in Martinique about nine years ago with a uh, sports team from Trinidad, 
and we had an event to attend and we were getting back to the hotel later the night so we asked the hotel to prepare our meals or if they could leave the restaurant open. They told us we can't do that because our trade union in France <laughs> won't permit us wow. to work past 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at that restaurant or whatever time it was. Then you have the Haitian Revolution which was also radical republicanism. And for the Haitian Revolution, when on January the 1st, 1804, when the real of many, but the real hero of the Haitian Revolution, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, feed us in the school books. Tell us to say no but to say no but was a great yes, There's no question about that. But to say no but to died in April 1803. <laughs> Haiti was declared as a republic on January 1st, 1804. To say no but didn't live to see Haiti as a free state. To say no but was a soldier, a wise. But he was doing what a lot of us find ourselves doing today. We fight on the side of one political party, and then we cross the floor, fight on the side of another political party. Then I say political party, I meant to say army. Fought on the side of the French, then fought on the side of the Spanish, then was summoned to France by Napoleon. He was tricked, double crossed. Kept in a prison until his death. Jean-Jacques Dessalines, when they established the Haitian Constitution, two of the main features were that one, any enslaved African from any part of the world that could escape from whatever territory they connected to and arrive on the shores of Haiti, Correct. they are automatically free True. and a Haitian citizen. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, according to the Constitution after the Haitian Revolution, white people could not own land. Go ahead, go ahead. As a white person in Haiti. Now, the thing is, they started violating the law slowly but surely. Then, when America occupied Haiti less than 100 years later, they officially changed the law. But there were already white Germans who were occupying the law. Just like for the great 1763 Burmese revolt led by Brother Cuffey, a national hero. That revolution was different to the 13 slave revolutions in Jamaica, the 10 slave revolutions in Cuba, the numerous slave revolutions in places like Martinique, Dominica, Antigua, in Tobago, in Grenada. That slave revolution in Guyana, they actually ran all of the white people out. There weren't any other slave rebellions that achieved that. Other slave rebellions that got even close to that, basically, were not. The Africans rebelled and the Africans left. So in Suriname, you have our great maroon community that they write in the literature calling them Bush Negroes. And then in Jamaica, you have Queen Nanny of the Maroons up in the hills. So we moved away, but in Guyana we stayed where we are Amen. and ran the white people out. But there was a great lesson for us to learn from yes, the white yes, people yes. that we ran out. Because yes, when we ran out, the white people from mid 1763 to early 1764, they went and formed alliances with their white brothers. Go ahead. Go ahead. And in less than a year, 1764, the white people came back into Guyana yeah, and took okay. over many of the territories that we had under our full control. Sure. 
Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir
and then ship it back to Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then when it gets back, and then the, the African brother or sister in the supermarket now picks up the, the good African chocolate and the chocolate that took a boat ride. And then we take the chocolate that was made by the white people with yeah. our yeah. own materials. So point number 10 of the 10 point plan of action for reparations is the transfer of technology. We furthermore add that the African Holocaust is the worst of its kind ever in all the annals of history, yet laws have been passed in 17 countries criminalizing the denial of the Jewish Holocaust, as we just said, which in comparison features only a small fraction of the atrocities and crimes against humanity that were the case during African enslavement. Jewish Holocaust denial is a crime in countries including France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Greece, and Israel each have enacted legislation to make it a criminal offense to have an opinion that is different to the narrative established by the Jews. We believe that it would be of tremendous benefit for the Caribbean region to adopt a similar perspective to preserve the strength of our collective contemporary struggle to break the chain of modern day slavery in its various forms. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said for the 19th anniversary of the Miniman March on October 19, 2014 in Jamaica, he said, how can we, Caribbean nations, be independent and allow ourselves to continue to function under the institutions of our former colonial masters. Mm -hmm. If these institutions include our schools, colleges, and universities, then we run the risk of our philosophical legacy being lost in the residue of a post-colonial education. Mm -hmm. It's worth mentioning that, like a light at the end of the tunnel, is seen in one particular living institution over in Europe, the University of Glasgow in Scotland, who agreed to pay 20 million British pounds in reparations to the Caribbean through a program with the University of West Indies. Let me see how many of you all heard about that. The University of Glasgow in Scotland, okay. Now, let me go through this very, very quickly. There are numerous institutions of various fields in Europe, in particular the United Kingdom, that became, and this is the findings of the University of Glasgow, many of their learning institutions became wealthy, powerful, and intergenerationally economically viable as a result of money that they received from the trade in enslaved Africa. The UK Guardian newspaper of August 25, 2019 highlighted that the Glasgow University is to pay 20 million pounds in reparations to atone for its historical links to the transatlantic slave trade in what the University of the West Indies has described as a bold historical. It signed an agreement with the University of the West Indies to fund a joint center for development research. Glasgow University discovered last year, 2018, that it had benefited financially from Scottish slave traders in the 18th and 19th centuries by between 16.7 million and 198 million pounds in today's money. It has therefore pledged to raise 20 million British pounds for the centre chiefly in research grants and gifts. Now this is a university. They're not doing like some within our region, getting some of the information and then denying it. They're saying, oh, wait, our university where we are learning and sending our children to benefited in 20 million British pounds in, in trade with slave Africans back then. And it's equivalent to 198 million pounds today. They engaged in their academic, historical, sociological research and came up with those truths and facts. So now, they say, okay, we now have to, in some way at all. Other British universities, including Oxford and Bristol, 
have been the focus of protests over their ties to the slave trade and to powerful colonialists such as Cecil Rhodes. In 2017, All Souls College at Oxford launched an annual scholarship for Caribbean students and paid a £100,000 grant to a college in Barbados in recognition of its funding from Christopher Codrington, a wealthy slave owner who bequeathed £10,000 in 1710 to build a library that bears his name. The Glasgow Agreement was first signed in Kingston, Jamaica on 31st of July 2018. Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University Center for Gold, Moral and Historic Step. And then, in addition to the principal of the Glasgow University, Professor Anton Muscatelli, said it was fitting that the final ceremony took place on the same day as International Day of Remembrance of the Slave Trade and its abolition, which is August 25th. He stated, talking about any institutional country's historical links to slavery can be a difficult conversation, but felt it was a necessary one for our university to have. Now, over in America, also for the upcoming 2020 United States presidential election, the issue of reparations is a major topic of discussion on the campaign trail. In fact, for much of the 150 years since the official end of slavery in the United States, talk of reparations has existed in political circles, but it will never get to that point of realization or completion until we get involved on the grassroots level to put pressure on politicians who have this issue in their hands. In 2019, the discussion became a full-blown political debate among politicians, presidential candidates, and academics. And this discourse took place on June 19, 2019, but in the halls of Congress at the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. And June 19th, of course, is that great day, Juneteenth, which is celebrated in the South, a holiday commemorating the day that black people were informed of the end of slavery in Texas. June 19th, or Juneteenth. These discussions included testimonies from a number of stakeholders including actor Danny Glover and Senator Cory Booker, among others, and examined through open and constructive discourse the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade, its continuing impact on the community, and the path towards reparations justice. We also have a number of the United States politicians who are going up for this election campaign stating what they intend to do for reparations. Now, beloved, as I begin to conclude, <coughs> laws against Jewish Holocaust denial have been proposed in many nations in addition to the 17 ways of reading and crime. But some proposals for laws have received criticism and faced opposition, most significantly from civil rights and human rights advocates who contend that such laws will violate people's established rights of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. But how come no one is raising issues of freedom of speech and freedom of expression when it comes to denying the Jewish holidays? And the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was actually banned from Facebook social media as well because he made a state a speech from Minister Farrakhan was taken off YouTube. But it's impossible to ban the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Right, right. yeah. 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 Minister Farrakhan made a statement. He said, I am not an anti Semite, but I am anti termite. Mm. Mm. And a termite is something that sustains its life by the destruction of another entity. And if you have one people who are extracting wealth from the enslavement, persecution, right, sure. and genocide of another people, that is like being a termite. Yeah. That can be anyone. Mm. But if you throw a stone into a crowd of dogs, mm. the one that yelps 
is the one that gets hit. Right. I didn't know this is why I said I'm not an anti semite but an anti termite. And then a group of people stand up and say, hey, you're insulting us. Mm. <laughs> and what does that say about them? So in France, the equivalent of the parliament, the gays are voted on July 13, 1990 to make it illegal to question the existence of crimes that fall in the category of black and humanity as defined in the London Charter of 1945 on the basis of which Nazi leaders were convicted by the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg in 1945 to 1946. Those crimes that were outlined in the Nuremberg trial, if you question, did you see that word? July 15, 1990, France made it illegal to question the existence of those crimes. So if you're in France and you say, why is there such a law where I'm going to be arrested or imprisoned for saying that the Jews shouldn't have any special privilege to ever speak up against them? You just raise the question, etc. In the Italian Parliament, extending an anti-racism law from 1975, approved law 16 of June 2016, number 115, criminalizing the spreading of Holocaust denial and making conviction for the crime subject to imprisonment for two to six years. Imagine you in jail for six years for denying the Jewish Holocaust. You see how they always depicted film, a, a cell, jam-packed prison cell filled with brothers. What you in for? I killed three people. What you in for? Possession of arms and ammunition. I had 12 machine guns. What you in for? I kidnapped a whole family. Executed two of my enemies. What you in for? Uh, I said the Jewish Holocaust. So what? Did you jail for six years for that? It is so absurd. And we are even here committing a crime. I mean, that God were in Guyana. If I was given this same speech here in Italy or France, it is an arrestable offense. In Belgium, Holocaust denial was made illegal in 1995 by the negationism law. 1995 amended in 1999, Article 1, which said whoever in the circumstances given in Article 444 of the Penal Code denies, grossly minimizes, attempts to justify, or approves the genocide committed by the German National Socialist regime, Adolf Hitler's party, during the Second World War, shall be punished by a prison sentence of eight days to one year and by a fine of 26 francs to 5,000 francs. In Greece, September 2014, with a vote of 54 out of 99 present of the 300 member Hellenic Parliament, the body was in summer session at the time, hence less than a third showed up. Greece amended its 1979 law on the penalization of actions or activities intending unto Racial Discrimination, Law N927-1979, to make malicious denial of the Jewish Holocaust and other crimes against humanity for the purposes of inciting violence, discrimination, or hatred, or by way of threat or insult, a criminal offense. In Hungary, the National Assembly of Hungary declared that denial or trivialization of the Jewish Holocaust a crime punishable by up to three years of imprisonment on February 23rd, 2010. The law was signed by President Laxio Solomon in March 2010. On June the 8th, the newly elected parliament changed the formulation of the law to punish those who deny the genocides committed by the National Socialist or Communist systems or deny other facts or deeds. The Jewish community has been successfully able to relieve itself from the after effects of their Holocaust while black people in the West remain landless, propertyless as a result of our Holocaust. So we 
Beyond the Elijah Muhammad said, a message to the black man, production has to start with the acquisition of land. As long as we don't have land, then somebody else will be the producer and we will be the consumer. This is similar to modern day slavery. Bearing all of this in mind, and following such a model, a solid, credible case can be presented to eventually criminalize the denial of the black outcast by persons not related by African ancestry. Scholars use the term denial to describe the views and methodology of Holocaust deniers in order to distinguish them from legitimate historical revisionists who challenge orthodox interpretations of history using established methodologies. But we have been like bystanders in our own struggles. And if Caribbean people don't network themselves as communities in spite of the governments that we have. We will continue to sit back and watch other ethnic groups become more and more powerful. I close with this. The National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, which is the major reparations movement in the United States, held their conference on June 22, 2019. Uh, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, also known as NCOBRA, invited the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to be their keynote speaker and to provide guidance on the issue of reparations. NCOBRA is a group that advocates that the United States government, United States corporations, and individuals who benefited from the labor of former slaves should pay reparations on an undisclosed amount and say that further study needs to be done to find the exact amount, but estimate that the amount be approximately $8 trillion. reparations <laughs> because of the many injuries caused from slavery and the continuing effect that it has had upon the black race. These reparations can take many forms, including land, economic development, and monetary resources. Now, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, his address at Encobra, looks more at us than at our enemies. And he said, until we black people are resurrected, meaning brought back to our original state and place, the nations of the earth will not find order because order comes from justice. Until the black man and black woman get justice, the world cannot. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Minister said, until we, black people, rise, the earth will be in convulsion. But when we are purified from our 400 years sojourn under an enemy, then we can purify everything else that came from us. Then it will be one world again and peace will reign because the black man is awake, resurrected, restored, repaired, and back on his post as the original man, the cream of the planet Earth, and the absolute God of the universe. Minister <laughs> we are a suffering people. And we can't afford the luxury any longer of feeding the divisions, the trial manifestations of slavery, and neocolonialism and colonialism. We have to see all of us who struggle as one nation, one people, with one great objective, total liberation of every black man, woman, and child on our planet. He said, think for the whole, no matter who they are, no matter what they are, where they are. Think for them, stand for them, work for them, live for them, and when you can't live anymore, die on behalf of them, on behalf of black people. The minister always teaches us that our unity is even more powerful than their money. Yes. But we spend more time chasing after their money than achieving our own. Go ahead, go ahead. And we will never achieve uniformity, which is different to unity. Unity is 
is when we all come together for a common cause. Uniformity is when we all look alike, dress alike, same hairstyle, same religion, both in the same political party, and are in the same social class. That will never happen. But unity is when, in spite of our differences in religion, in politics, in social class, in educational levels, or geographical, or national affiliation, that we still see ourselves as one family. And the potential of black economics is so great. And I want to just share this story with you before I conclude. And it's a story about a hotel owner named Jenny. So Jenny, at Jenny's hotel, was at the front desk, and a tourist came in. And the tourist put $1,000 down on the table. And the tourist told Jenny, I want to stay in your hotel tonight. But I want to see the rooms first, and see if they're up to standard, and if they are, then I'll stay in the hotel. If not, I will leave. Jenny calls her assistant to take the tourist upstairs to look at the rooms. When the assistant comes, takes the tourist upstairs, Jenny takes the $1,000 and she takes it to her mechanic. Because her mechanic fixed her car the day before, but she didn't pay him as yet. So she took the $1,000, paid off the mechanic. The mechanic took the money and took it to his electrician. Because the electrician rewired the home of the mechanic the day before, and the mechanic did not pay the electrician as well. <laughs> when the electrician got the money, the electrician took the money by a plumber. Because the plumber had fixed the pipes in the electrician's home the day before, and he owed them for the job. Now when the plumber got the $1,000, the plumber took the $1,000 to a restaurant owner. Because the plumber had a function at a restaurant, he had some friends over as guests, and they didn't pay him as yet, so he paid off his bill. And when the restaurant owner got the $1,000, the restaurant owner took the $1,000 right back to Jenny's hotel, because he had a function at Jenny's hotel the day before, and he didn't pay as yet. So the restaurant owner puts the $1,000 right back down on the same spot. When the tourist put the thousand dollars when he first came in, they said, right after that, the tourist comes back downstairs, tells Jenny, I'm sorry, but I won't be staying at your hotel tonight, picks up the thousand dollars and leaves. Five thousand dollars was just spent. Five thousand dollars was just circulated within a private economy. Where is the money? It goes to show that if we unite, pool our resources, open skills banks and think tanks, settle our differences, and start to live as one black family, our unity within itself can generate economic power, strength, and fortitude. We don't need to be chasing after their money. All we need to do is unite. So the Honorable Minister Lewis Farrakhan said we will always be behind until and unless we act and think for the whole of our people. The question is, what do we do with our time? Because there's another generation, depending on what we do with our time, that we can pass them the battle of time so that the struggle will continue until the victory is ours. It is only vanity that makes us think that victory should come in the, our lifetimes. It is knowledge that allows us to see that when you have a problem as deep as complex as the problems that black people have, it took years to put us in this condition, it's going to take years to get us yes. out of it. Yes. But each one of us has a work to perform during our lifetime, and we, if we are true to the gift that God has given us, if we are true to the principle of love, then we will adore the ancestors who laid the foundation mm -hmm. that we stand on today. Love only force that will put Eric Eagle to rest and cause us to see how much of nothing I and we are as individuals, but how great we are when we can put our ego into submission to what is in the best interest of the whole. Yes. Finally, Minister Farrakhan says, when the lion roars, all species understand that is not my language. 
But that lion is talking to me. And I better understand what the lion is saying because it is a warning. We are the lions of civilization. If reparations does not repair our broken minds and corrupted souls and bring us anew again, we can say we're engaged in reparations following. All our organizations will fail if love for one another and love for the Creator is not at the root of it. Because any gift that you have, you did not give it to yourself. Any gift that you discover that you have, you ought to know that somebody that loved you more than you loved yourself gave you that gift. Beloved, our most precious resource is the human resource, and the most precious of the human resource are our youth. We have to engage in succession planning to teach, motivate, and inspire our young people that they are the ones who are going to carry the struggle into the future. It might look like we fail if we're on our deathbeds and the struggle hasn't been achieved as yet, but it's continuing in them. This is why the great Kwame Nkrumah said, revolutions are fought by men who think as men of action and men who act as men of thought. And the great Jomo Kenyatta, first Prime Minister of Kenya, said, African solidarity can no longer be a dream or a vision or an intention. African solidarity has to be a decision. And that decision, in many instances, is to put aside our petty rivalries, put our youth first. So we published a book, Knowledge is Power, 40 Lessons in Black Studies, where we gave an educational curriculum, the outline of the syllabus with lesson plans, teaching and learning content, user-friendly for the young students with the youth in mind to learn all of their history of the African Holocaust and slavery. Our children have to know all of the great things that black people did. Our children have to know that it was black people who were the first people on earth who gave civilization to the planet, who built the first universities, libraries, schools, colleges, and living institutions, who also established the first towns, villages, cities, and civilizations. But it was that exodus of white students from 640 to 320 BC into Africa as taught to us by the William Guyanese scholar George G.M. James and Stolen Legacy. And then began the African Holocaust, where we were taken out of Africa, brought with our original African and Muslim names, our language, our culture, religion, morals, folkways, laws, and norms. But today we have all these great philosophies that we have to become acquainted with. The teachings of the Honorable Marcus Garvey, who said, Africa for the Africans and home and abroad. And a people who have knowledge of their history is like a tree without roots. But also, a people who do not properly document their history at the risk of someone else writing that history for them in the best interest of those who are doing the rewriting. We have to learn the principles of Nelson Mandela, who for 27 years stayed in prison in a fight for freedom, but also of his great wife at the time, Winnie Mandela, who was a true freedom fighter. About the black power philosophy of Kwame Ture, formerly Stokely Carmichael, who spoke about institutionalized racism, and in Trinidad and Tobago, we, the nation of Islam, acquired three quarters of an acre of land from the state, and with our own hands, with no money from the government, mm. built a 6,000 square foot education center, which we named the Kwame Ture Network. <laughs> The wisdom of great Guyanese scholars such as Cecil Gutsmoor, such as our beloved brother Ivan Van Sertima, yeah. who wrote yeah. Blacks in Silence in the beginning for Columbus, a central reader. Also, our beloved scholar Walter Rodney, who wrote Ground Rich with My Brothers and also All of Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And we also have contemporary scholars of Guyana, such as our brother right here in the audience, Brother Gerald Pereira, who is a formal speaker of the I thank you, 
here, Brother Gerald Pereira, and we appreciate so much your work and the contributions that you're making to the struggle. But our people also have to learn about Dr. Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, but the truth of Dr. Martin Luther King in his last days in particular, they selectively extract parts of Dr. Martin Luther King's history in the same way that they conveniently extract parts of the history of Malcolm X. So they ignore Malcolm X's whole struggle and take out the last 11 months. And with Martin Luther King, they do the opposite. They highlight Martin Luther King's main days during the March on Washington and extract his last days. Mm. Come on, you can't have your cake and eat it. Choose one. But they, ex they conveniently extract the part of the biographies of Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X that saves death. But Martin Luther King said in one of his last speeches, just before he was assassinated, quoting Hugo Victor, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, When there is darkness, yes, sin will be committed. But the real guilty one is not he who commits the sin, yes, but it is he who creates the darkness. And then he said, White America has created the darkness that black people have found themselves sitting in. The truth is so hard that the fans have to come back.